The, the first four uh, World Water Development Reports um, were triannual and were released during the World Water Forums. And uh, this has changed. And starting in 2014, the reports are going to be released on an annual basis. These will be much shorter and thematic. And so the first thematic report uh, due on Water Day in 2014 is on water and energy. So I'm just going to quickly go over like, the more or less the structure and to show you what you can, what you can expect uh, in the next report and uh, maybe with a few highlights. So the first chapter is just setting the stage and it has a lot to do with what Torgny was talking about. Um, describing, you know, the essential, the challenges, the um, differences and similarities between water and energy. Energy is, for instance, energy is big business. The global energy market is estimate and, uh, estimated annually at $6 trillion. This completely dwarfs anything uh, water-related in the water services industries. And because of this, water tends to have a much greater potential uh, political attention. And so remain, whereas water remains perceived more as a social or environmental issue at the political level. The next chapter focuses on water. It is the World Water Development Report. And so we report on new emerging trends, um, trends related to water availability, the energy, and we report on the energy required to provide water services. Here's, um, this, was, this came out in uh, Nature last year. And so we also try to populate the World Water Development with, Report with new findings uh, that come out. And this, is, this was from Nature and it's showing that the, there's more and more evidence on incre increased stress on groundwater. Chapter 3 will focuses on different types of energy, their demands for and impacts on water, and how these are likely to evolve over the next two decades. There's no escaping it. According to the IEA, global energy demand is expected to increase by one-third uh, by 2035. And energy currently accounts for 15% of all fresh water withdrawals. Now, this is not something that's usually reported. Usually what you get is, the, you know, and I'm sure most of you know this, a 70% ag, 10% uh, domestic or municipal water, and 20% industry. But this 20% industry, 75% of it is for energy. So we might want to think about this a little bit diff differently, and this is one of the one of these slow, stepwise uh, things that we're going that we're trying to accomplish with this report. Now, note that the scale on the x-axis is logarithmic. So again, there's no escaping it. Water withdrawals for energy are estimated to increase by 20 percent by 2035, but energy water consumption is expected to uh, increase by 85 percent over that same period. And we'll get into that a little, but that just has to do with how you, you, water is used to produce energy. Although energy demand is expected to increase uh, by one-third, electric power generation is expected to increase by 70%. This has a monumental implications for water. From a global perspective, the fact that certain renewables, wind, solar, PV, uh, may not require much water is actually, a, it's great, but it's of little consequence if you're looking at the big picture. Although, of course, these, uh, these along the, with other renewables like geothermal can have significant local implications uh, and impacts on water demand. But the bottom line is thermal power is going to continue to dominate. Again, the x-axis is logarithmic. So from a water point of view, the water requirements for cooling for thermal power depend on the cooling technology, of course, open loop, closed loop, dry cooling. But there's a major question of where do you want, do you want to use water in terms of withdrawals for open loop cooling, or do you want to use less water but consume it all for closed loop cooling? So it's not, a, it, it, there's, it, 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 the, there's no one solution. It really depends on your water availability and other demands in the same area. But these decisions will have to be made if you're going to reach the increased, uh, the, meet the increased electricity demand. 
uh, we, I know you can't read through this. This is just, to, we have 29 uh, a, data, uh, a data annex with 29 global, in, global statistics uh, related to water and energy. And this we will continue doing with the annual reports that are thematic and we'll also be putting together a database for each theme. Uh, part two of the report uh, is done by five lead agencies that are partners, uh, UN Water Partners, looking at more of a specific theme or sub-theme along water and energy. So we have the World Bank uh, looking at um, infrastructure and financing, giving specific examples of ways that water and energy infrastructure can be combined to yield positive economic and social benefits through coordinated technical approaches. Uh, FAO took the lead on a chapter focusing on the important water, energy, food nexus related aspects. Uh, UN Habitat and Bouchan gave a nice outline and summary of what's to, what can be expected in the, um, in the UN Habitat uh, uh, chapter on, uh, on cities and urban, uh, under, in the context of accelerating urbanization. And John gave a good uh, summary of what to be expected in UNIDO's chapter um, that focuses on manufacturing and the roles and responsibilities of private sector companies. And finally, our friends at UNEP put together a, uh, they led a thematic section that concludes the thematic part of the report and on ecosystems. Part three of the report examines specific issues relevant to different regions. Led by the five U, uh, UN regional economic commissions, each one of the short chapters examines the most pertinent water-related uh, issues and challenges, but from that regional perspective. And the last part, chapter, part four, the concluding chapters, uh, the first, chapter 15, describes you know, more of a broad range of approaches and responses from policy, cultural, and economic perspectives. It's the idea of like, what you need to create an enabling environment for change and to accelerate progress. The, the next chapter provides many examples of actions being carried out by water and energy users, businesses, local governments, and other organizations who are actually implementing change, creating synergies along the lines indicated in the, throughout the report. And the report uh, concludes with, uh, with a look at the role of the United Nations and the international community, the role they can play in formulating responses to energy and water challenges. My last slide, I know, I know we're pressed for time and everybody wants coffee. So I won't get into the big detail on this, but I just want to let you know that these issues are covered and as uh, how do I say, in the most open uh, and transparent way possible. So we're not saying fracking's good, fracking's bad. We're saying this is, how, what, how, this is what fracking does, and this is what it's been shown to do, and it's still up to, up to decision makers to, uh, to decide and to regulate. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention.